power. An often overlooked luxury of our modern lives, access to the electrical grid and the power it provides are ubiquitous parts of 21st century life. How many times have you had your plans change because all of a sudden the power went out? Usually this happens during inclement weather, like a massive wind or lightning storm that knocks down a power line or something similar. It makes sense that if you disturb the wires that carry power to your house, the power will have a difficult time making the journey. But why does it have to be carried so far in the first place? Well, the power grid is something that has been developing over the course of centuries, and we've slowly been learning the most practical ways to deliver power from a power plant which generates the electricity to your house, which consumes it. The first basic principle of the power grid is that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred. In the words of Electro Boom, There is no free energy device! There is no free energy. Energy is generated at the power plant, distributed to your home, and then consumed by your light bulbs, your washing machine, and your stove. Why do we do it like this? Well, for one, if you've ever been to a power plant, you know that they're really, really noisy. This is because there's lots of industrial machinery in a power plant, and to provide power, they generate a lot of noise. A major challenge for these grids is generating at nighttime, when street lights need to be powered. To provide this power at night, they need to be on 24-7. This is because energy storage is not an easy task. The power must be generated as it is consumed. This means that plants will have to be running at nighttime to power the lamps. Living next to a power plant isn't very attractive because of all the noise that it makes. Imagine trying to sleep while it's running at night. Now, how do the power plants generate their power? Remember, there is no free energy. Energy is not created or destroyed. It is only transferred. We have many methods of power generation. Oil, coal, natural gas, hydroelectric, geothermal, nuclear, piezoelectric, wind, solar, and even more. But the basic principle of all of these is the same. Convert some source of energy into electrical energy that can be transmitted through wires and harnessed by the electrical grid. How do we carry power from plants to your house? Those massive power lines have more to them than you might think. It's actually thanks to Tesla that we enjoy such a practical form of this electrical grid. The Westinghouse Electric Company hired him in their early days to compete with Edison's electric company. Westinghouse licensed Tesla's patents for alternating current and induction motors in 1888. The exact details of this war of the currents are often misrepresented. Tesla produced the patents for Westinghouse, and at first, he didn't really receive much payment because Westinghouse's electric company was in trouble. The capitalist markets of the 19th century were ruthless and cutthroat. Tesla is often remembered as having not been fairly compensated for his work, but this is only partially true. After Edison's company left him unpaid for his work, Tesla left Edison Electric for the Westinghouse Electric Company. Later on, Westinghouse purchased Tesla's patents for a lump sum payment of $216,000. Many years later, adjusted for inflation, this is $6.6 .6 million in today's money. He made enough money from his patents to pursue his independent research. He was not as really as poor as common conception seems to believe. Anyway, Nikola Tesla's work on AC, or alternating current power systems and induction motors, revolutionized the grid. How did his patents do this? A large part had to do with the polyphase delivery system. What is meant by many phases is that the voltage waveforms are meant to vary with time, creating a current that also changes with time. A very large part of how Tesla's patents revolutionized the power grid was by developing his three-phase power delivery system and a device that I've spoken about before. It uses magnetism to transform power, a power transformer. Now, what does that actually mean? To understand this, we've got to do some math. Sorry, can't really be avoided. Volta used an analogy likening the flow of electricity as something similar to the flow of water. 
I think the reason for this is because he noticed that the amount of electric current that would flow out of the voltaic pile was proportionate to the number of plates that he would connect to it. In a way, the electrochemical potential of the cells acted sort of like pressure on the electricity, and more potential would mean more current flow. This is basically the foundation of Ohm's law. This formula can be used for most calculations, but modern physicists have run into a bit of a problem with it. What happens if the resistance is zero? The law just describes the relationship between voltage and current in most substances. But is such a thing as zero resistance possible? Well, actually, yes. And that's what lets us take pictures of the inside of your body with an MRI machine. To produce the magnetic field strength of three Teslas that modern MRIs need and use every day, we actually take advantage of this possibility. Superconducting magnets are named for the wires that are cooled to an extremely low temperature. Once at this temperature, their electrical resistance essentially drops to zero. Ohm's law doesn't really work anymore. If you applied any potential across this element, it would produce an infinite current, physically impossible. This is what is often meant by modern physics. The equation that Ohm's law comes from is part of the old school of classical physics, started by Newton and carried on by Maxwell. These formulas are still useful for most situations, but as we've learned more about the world, we've discovered that they are not perfect. They are extremely useful analytical tools for answering most of our questions. But unfortunately, sometimes we run into a problem that they can't answer. For this, a new theory needs to be developed. Ohm's law is a fundamental principle of circuit analysis for modern electrical engineers, and indeed even for others like Edison and Tesla. The postulation of Ohm's law was required for the development of electricity. With Ohm's law, scientists and engineers could understand how to design an electrical grid. The earliest grids came to the industrialized world slowly. As Faraday began to understand the connection between electricity and magnetism, and how mechanical energy, connected to some sort of mechanical force like a steam turbine or even a water current, could generate electricity. The lights came on in the late 19th century. Oil lamps were replaced with electric lights. To understand how this complex mechanism worked, I think it would be helpful to go through another principle of physics, the conservation of energy. I'll just lay out the basics. There is no free energy. Energy must come from somewhere. It is not created or destroyed. It is not generated or consumed. It is merely transferred, converted into various forms, like light, heat, sound, and many others. One of the best ways to illustrate this is with a simple everyday activity, cooking. When you cook something, you're basically putting energy into it until it's cooked. The heat has to come from somewhere, right? Wood, coal, or in modern times, an electrical outlet. Developments in chemistry and physics gave us a new word for analyzing this phenomenon, thermodynamics. We began to understand that burning the combustibles released the energy of the chemical bonds. That energy that was released was transferred to its surroundings in the form of heat. By directing it towards a tank of water, the water could be boiled, pressurized, and a steam engine created. With enough steam pressure, the boiling water could actually move machinery. The Industrial Revolution was greatly accelerated by the discovery of the steam engine. But this video is about the electrical grid. So why is this important? Because the first electrical generators were coal powered. By using a steam engine and connecting it to a turbine, a magnet could be rotated, which, as discovered by Faraday, would create an electric potential. Essentially, the mechanical energy of the turbine could be converted into electrical energy running through the wires and powering lights. With a boiler, the thermal energy of the flame created by burning the coal could be harnessed by a piston used to turn a crankshaft which then rotates. With a turbine, the mechanical energy of a rotating magnetic field could be converted into electrical energy. With Maxwell's equations and many other advancements like Ohm's law, generators could be designed. And soon after, light bulbs brought illumination to the cities of the late industrial era and slowly brought about the transition into the digital age that we currently experience. Now, there are two main groups of generators, alternating current and direct current. They're named for the direction of current that they provide. 
Direct current only provides current in one direction, while alternating current changes it back and forth, usually at a speed that's fast enough that your eye can't detect it, say in the instance of a light bulb. The alternating current alternates back and forth between two directions. This is where we get to the war of the currents in popular fiction. Contrary to popular belief, it was actually between Thomas Edison and a new competitor in the electrical utility market, George Westinghouse. Westinghouse saw that the alternating current system in Europe could allow for much larger power plants to be built, which could distribute power over a much larger distance. Direct current seemed to have some problems, because in order to distribute the power over a long distance, the wires would need to be made extremely thick, or another power plant would need to be made. If the wires were too long, they would need to be made thicker in order to drop their resistance and make electricity pass through them easier. Edison undertook an extensive media campaign to make AC look like an unsafe power system. But fortunately, it looks like it didn't work because all across the world, we use alternating current to power our electric devices. Direct current is only very rarely used, usually only coming in the form of batteries. Almost every power grid on Earth uses alternating current power. Now this is where the famous Nikola Tesla comes into the picture. Westinghouse's engineer, Benjamin Lamb, succeeded in creating an efficient induction motor created using patents that the company had licensed from Tesla himself. Tesla's polyphase alternating current would be much more efficient at delivering power across larger distances mainly due to Tesla's innovative use of power transformation. Polyphase basically just means many phased. Most electrical grids across the world use three phase power. It seems to be the most cost efficient way of transporting energy. At this point in history, the alternating current system was popular in Europe. Many different independent inventors came up with different variants on this alternating current system. Tesla is one among many contributors to the polyphase system of power distribution. They all used power transformation to deliver power across large distances and to great effect. Now, what is this exactly? Power transformation refers to the use of magnetic power transformers to basically step up and step down the voltage. These are ingenious inventions that make the task of distributing electrical power much easier. The problem is that because of the physical principles, it can only work with a time varying current. A direct current, or the one that Edison was using, would only short out a transformer. This is the main physical difference between the two current systems. By varying the current with time, an alternating current system can take advantage of transformer action and use it to increase the voltage carried in the wires, increasing the power without increasing the current. Electrical power is the product of voltage and current. So if you want to transport more power, you have to have more current or more voltage. And sometimes if you start to draw too much current, well, it can cause some serious problems. A part of designing a power grid for the distribution of power is a physical reality. Wires are not perfect conductors. Copper, gold, silver, they all still have a little bit of resistance. And so if the current going through them gets too high, they can overheat. This can result in some terrible consequences if the calculations were incorrect. The wire was sized incorrectly and melts. Electricity is powerful. So by stepping up the voltage with the transformer, the power through the wires could be much higher even though the current was very low. Basically, by increasing the voltage, you basically increase the amount of energy that each individual electron will carry. The elegance of the polyphase system, in addition to the utility of transformers, is that power can be distributed amo along multiple lines and alternated in time so that one side of the wire doesn't conduct most of the electricity all at once. And so the wires can be made thinner and more cost efficient. The genius of Tesla and the Westinghouse engineers was putting this system together with the use of complex numbers to much more easily accomplish the calculations for wire sizing, generator capacity, 
and other important figures. Something I remember from school was my professor saying something about imaginary numbers once. He said that they don't really understand how they work, and they just sort of plug in a number and get an answer out at the end. I don't know if he was serious, but from my impression he was, and I'm still a little triggered by this statement to this day. Imaginary numbers are not imaginary. They're just named that because they lie on a perpendicular axis to the real number line. What's the opposite of real? Well, imaginary. Originally, this was actually a derogatory term, and for a long time, imaginary numbers weren't really respected in the academic community. It took the work of other mathematicians years later, like Leonhard Euler, who came up with Euler's formula, and Carl Friedrich Gauss, who came up with Gauss's laws. Practical use of so-called imaginary numbers was proven. Many people started to adopt them and use them for other things, including Tesla. I think it's better to understand them as complex numbers with real and uh, imaginary components. It's just a different way of doing math for certain situations. Some engineers actually know this as the phasor representation of voltage. Interesting that Tesla was developing a three-phase power system. Do you think the two might be related? Thanks to the work of these brilliant inventors, engineers, and scientists, electricity has become more than just a comfort in the modern world. It has become a mainstay of modern life. The security and safety that we enjoy are greatly supported by the use of the electrical grid, along with near instant communication with radio and other communication systems in the modern world. The ingenuity of the alternating current power system is fascinating, and over the course of just a century, it has developed into a world-spanning mechanism of generators, transmission systems, and the various ways that we consume it in our everyday lives.